There are fine musicals, and then there's Showboat. Well, Showboat was written in 1926. It finally opened at the Ziegfeld Theater in December of 1927. And it was a show quite unlike anything Broadway had ever seen before. Ziegfeld was famous, well, he was the glorifier of American womanhood, and people went to Ziegfeld shows expecting long-legged American beauty roses and, and all of that. And they got into the theater, and the first thing they hear is this crashing A minor chord from the overture, which is a very grim, dark, brooding piece. And the overture is never played anymore because producers and directors think it's depressing. And then the curtain goes up on not a chorus of beautiful young dancing girls, but a dockside in Mississippi with 30 black stevedores sweating under the Mississippi sun singing, niggers all work on the Mississippi, niggers all work while the white men play. The effect on the audience must have been total shock because suddenly they weren't being presented with a musical comedy as they knew it, but a real musical play with operatic dimensions. And nothing like that had ever been attempted before in the musical theater. Ferber had been working on a play that was out of town on its way to Broadway. There was terrible trouble, and she mentioned to the producer uh, that uh, she was just very upset about everything, and he said that the next time he does a show, he'd like to do it on a showboat and just drift down the Mississippi River and stop off at all the towns. And she said to Winthrop Ames, the producer, what's a showboat? Well, he told her, and she was fascinated by it. There was no public library where one could do research at the time on showboats and so she actually set out to meet all of the old-time actors that she could find who had worked on them and then even went down south to um, North Carolina and spent a whole summer on a showboat called the James Adams Floating Theater just to get a sense of what life was like for those people. Who cares if my boat goes upstream or if the gale bids me go with the river's flow, I drift along with my fancy. Sometimes I thank my lucky stars, my heart is free. And other times I wonder, where's the mate for me? Showboats were barges, flat bottom barges that actually drew only a few feet of water because the Mississippi was very, very shallow. They didn't have the Army Corps of Engineers in those days constantly dredging out the bottom. They were pushed by boats that had big paddle wheels in the rear. And they, it was an auditorium that seated anywhere from a few hundred people to about 14 or 1,500 people for the largest one, which was the Golden Rod. The company lived above it in dressing rooms and they spent the whole summer going up and down the Mississippi River and sometimes the Ohio River, a tributary. Both the musical and the novel begin in the 1880s along the Mississippi River. We meet a very young girl, Magnolia Hawks. She falls in love with a riverboat gambler, Gaylord Ravenel. He whisks her off with her baby to Chicago, loses his money. She is now a woman alone in Chicago at the turn of the century and has to survive and pay for the education of her child. And so what does she do? She turns to the one thing that she knows she can do, performing, singing, the things that she did on the showboat.
the novel, unlike the musical, follows not only the story of Magnolia, a very strong female protagonist, which is typical of Edna Ferber, but it also follows her daughter. And at least one third, the last third of the book, deals with the maturing of her daughter as a major Broadway star. And so it brings us right up to the 1920s. The book was published in 1926. Jerome Kern read it, called up Hammerstein. Kern asked him to participate. Hammerstein had essentially been collaborating with Otto Harbach, uh, an older, more experienced librettist on Broadway. And this was his very first show of any consequence. He wrote a few very early shows that don't matter much, but this was his very first show for which he alone wrote the book and lyrics. Very shortly after Kern and Hammerstein agreed to write together, they wrote most of the major songs of the first act and promptly called up Florin Ziegfeld, who was the major producer on Broadway, played it for him, and contrary to myth, Ziegfeld instantly fell in love with what they had done and signed them to do it. Ziegfeld announced that he was going into production in just a few more months and had no idea what he was getting into. He had no idea that this show was going to go through this long period of gestation. The, the amazing thing to me is that it was done so quickly. Uh, they wrote that thing in the space of a year. And I don't know how they did that, because it's so much more complicated, really, than anything else he ever wrote. Showboat has a 40-year span, you know, when Captain Andy starts out, he's about 40 years old, I figure. And uh, when the play ends, he's 82. And that's quite a large span. Uh, not only for characters to play through an evening to evolve into older people, but to encompass all the material and the environment that changes in the space of 40 years. Captain Andy, Captain Andy, here's your landing, your homemade brandy, with preserve and apple brandy, Mama's Christmas belongs to you. Captain Andy, Captain Andy, nine years old when it opened uh, at the Ziegfeld Theater in New York. And uh, I mean, I don't remember the precise moment that I saw it, but I remember the show quite well from that time, because uh, I used to see it quite often. I'd go to matinees and, and uh, visit backstage with Helen Morgan, and my father would take me around. And I used to stand in the wings sometimes and watch the show. And 1927, and uh, it was just another one of Dad's shows at that point. It was the first show that dealt with serious subjects in a serious way uh, that encompassed a great uh, stretch of time, showed people changing. Uh, and People frequently, when they comment on the theater, use Oklahoma as a landmark uh, show. And in many ways, it was. But it would, wouldn't have existed if Showboat hadn't come first. What was it, 20, 18, 15 years before that? They happened to have been written by the same man. <laughs> but uh, they were both in their way. They were landmarks. But Showboat, I think, had more, more significance because it changed, it introduced musical theater as opposed to musical comedy. The opening on Broadway was extraordinary. Goldie Clow, Siegfeld's secretary, told me that Siegfeld insisted no curtain calls, whatever. There never were throughout the entire run of the show. And there was no exit music, none. When the curtain came down on the last few bars of Old Man River, that was it. And the audience, opening night, was paralyzed. It had never seen anything like this. Goldie insists 
that they didn't applaud anything. They didn't applaud Old Man River. They didn't laugh. They laughed at some of the jokes, but not very many because they weren't even certain they were supposed to laugh. They were so stunned by the novelty of this work. And when it was over, the curtain fell, and everybody expects music to start playing, a little exit music and, you know, curtain call music. There never was any, not a note. And the audience just sat there and applauded in shock, a little, very little, and walked out in utter silence opening night. And Ziegfeld was in hysteria all throughout the performance and paced up and down. He said, I've got a failure, I've got a catastrophe. And Goldie tried to reassure him this was in the back of the house during opening night. He was certain it was a disaster. And the next morning, the lines were around the block. The reviews were absolutely ecstatic. The showboat went through one revival that was very important. It ran on Broadway from December 27, 1927 until spring of 1929, then went on tour. And the tour ended because Irene Dunn, who had replaced Norma Terrace in the role of Magnolia, was signed by RKO Radio Pictures to make her film debut. They saw her in Baltimore, and the show promptly closed. It could have gone on. And in the Depression, Ziegfeld lost all his money in gambling and in, uh, in stocks. And he decided to go back after a few flops to a sure thing, a revival of Showboat. And he had almost the whole original Broadway cast, the original sets and costumes. Jules Bledsoe was unavailable, and so he replaced him with Paul Robeson, who was the first choice to create the part of Joe in any case. I think there are certain roles that are always haunted by their creators. I think anyone who plays Julie has to live up to an image of Helen Morgan, because Helen Morgan had a very slender, fragile, high, sweet soprano voice, but there was such pathos in her voice. She was such a brilliant actress, and there was such pathos in her life because she was just a pathetic alcoholic addicted to brandy. And um, at the age of 27, she was like a middle-aged woman when she created the role. Um, I think the toughest role to play in Showboat is Julie. Because when you sing Bill, you can't sing Bill to the quality of your own voice. You have to act Bill. You have to be a dying alcoholic who can barely get the sound out. Oh, I can't explain. It's surely not his brain that makes me thrill. I love him because he's wonderful. Because he's just my bill. He can't play golf or tennis or... There was a man named Ray Knight. Was a young boy in Jacksonville, Florida, in the early 1930s. His mother bought him a home movie camera, 16-millimeter home movie camera, silent, for his 16th birthday, and a round-trip ticket to New York, and said, son, here's a ticket, go to New York, take all the pictures of the sights. And in 1932, he attended the revival of Showboat. In Showboat, he didn't shoot much, so you have to look at it pretty fast uh, to see what you're going to see. But there are glimpses of Helen Morgan getting off the piano after she's sung Bill. There's a glimpse of the old Joe in 1927 with gray hair, still whittling and singing his Act Two reprise of Old Man River. There's a little bit of the Act One finale uh, where you see Dennis King and uh, Norma Terrace going off into the wings stage right uh, to get married in the wings, presumably. Uh, there's a little bit of Can't Help Loving That Man from Act One, Scene Two, and you see a little bit of Norma Terrace doing her, her shuffle, which is adorable to see, and great big Tess Gardella as Aunt Jemima. She was an Italian lady who always appeared in blackface. 
One of the things when I think about Showboat in those early days, one of the things that always springs to my mind is meeting Paul Robeson backstage at, at I think it was the Drury Lane. And um, I was pretty small. And I was introduced to this man that I couldn't see. He was way up there someplace. And he put this great, enormous hand out, and I put my tiny little hand in it. And then I panned up until I saw this great, broad, black, smiling face. It was the kindliest face I'd ever seen. Maybe the one I've ever, ever seen since. Uh, and just embraced you with his warmth. He was a, he was a truly great man, Mr. Robson. Oh, very misunderstood piece, a very oversung and often badly abused piece. It's a very simple thing. You know, people are surprised when they see the whole show. People have been surprised listening to this record at how very tiny the role of Joe is, considering how famous it made Paul Robeson and how famous he made the song. Its message is more subtle than people think. I mean, it has become, and this is partly through Paul Robeson's use of it in latter years, a protest song, which it is not. And Hammerstein himself, in his book of lyrics, when he was introducing this lyric, described it as a song of resignation with a protest implied, which I think says it all. I mean, and in the context of the show, when you see these generations of the Hawks family aging and dying and time going on, that what Old Man River is, is the metaphor for the evening. Life goes on. It isn't just that blacks are oppressed on the Mississippi. It's that everybody in the world, black, white, yellow, everybody has their own set of trials and troubles, whatever they may be. Oh, Joe, did you see that young man I was talking to? Morning, Miss Nola. Yep, I see him. See a lot like him on the river. Oh, Joe, he was such a gentleman. Have you seen Miss Julie? I got to tell her. I got to ask her what she thinks. Let ask the old river what he thinks. He knows all about them boys. He knows all about everything. There's an old man called the Mississippi. That's the old man that I'd like to be. What does he care if the world's got troubles? What does he care if the land ain't free? Old man river, that old man river, he must know something. But don't say nothing, he just keeps rolling, he keeps on rolling along. He don't plant taters, he don't plant cotton, and them that plant them is so I tend to think of Joe as a one-man Greek chorus, you know. I mean, he's always been there to comment, and every time it's Old Man River. <laughs> it's a great song. It's, it's a very universal song. But the funny thing about the song is, with the times, it's changed so much. I mean, it's new meaning for me to sing it. I mean, uh, a lot of people started off with it. A lot of Joe started off with a mawkish-type character. I'm very defiant when I do this song, you know. Uh, I speak, I try to speak for all people, not just the blacks. Although it does pertain to blacks, but um, 
It's a great piece. I mean, Kern couldn't have put it better, although I hear that Florence Ziegfeld didn't particularly like it. It made him very nervous, and I can understand why. You and me, we sweat and strain, body all aching and racked with pain. Hope that much lift that bill, get a little drunk, and you land. Scotland is thrown down with the first line, niggers all work on the Mississippi. And what Hammerstein was trying to do with that was to shock audiences and to force them to think about what working conditions, living conditions, social conditions were like for black people in the South in the 1880s. Here's this chorus of stevedores lugging cotton bales on their back in probably the 98 degree Mississippi July sun. Think of what these people must have smelled like. Think of the manure. I mean, there were no cars. It was all horses and heat and stagnant water. I mean, it must have been a hideous place to be working. And niggers all work on the Mississippi. You know, and they're not singing about themselves. They're not saying, we are niggers. We are, I mean, that, this is the word that is applied to them and everything that it implies about how people treat them and feel about them and treat them. It, it does something to you, you know. I think you have a tape of... Um the recording session when I sang that. And when I got to the part, niggas all work on the Mississippi, I, the contempt I had, I mean, I think I saw the tape and I didn't believe what I saw only because I didn't know what was happening then. And the sweat, the anger that came out, you know, when you're singing it, you don't know what you, but I saw this film and I just, it, it just, it really, it moved me, you know, it moved me in a, in a strange sort of way. Niggas all work on the Mississippi. Niggas all work while the white folk play. Pulling those boats from the dawn till sunset. Getting no rest till the judgment day. It was my great wish for this recording to have a truly black chorus. And the first chorus rehearsal, they opened their vocal scores and saw this word. And explosion. And I said, you know, well, thank you very much. We'll get the Ambrosian Singers, which is what we ended up doing. And I, frankly, when I listen to the recording now, I cringe when that word comes. And that's good, because that's what it was put there for. It's to make people cringe. implications. In the Hammerstein version, um, he's very concerned, I think, about using the blacks as a kind of life force. They remain close to the river, and the river gives them the energy and the vitality and the sense of eternity. And it's very interesting that the characters who leave the river get into trouble. And of course, Old Man River can almost be regarded as a leitmotif, even though Hammerstein had no intention of that happening. Uh, he did confirm with me the old story that the reason Old Man River was written is that they needed something to end Act One, Scene One. <laughs> People always say, uh, you know, oh, it's a, such a brilliant song and you must have thought it out, you know, and it's thematically so this and that. And he always used to say, so the joke went, that he did it just to have the curtain close on act one, scene one, so they could change the set to act one, scene two. And he did confirm that. He said, that's why I wrote it. You and me, we sweat and strain, body all aching and racked with pain. Hope that march, lift that bell, we get a little drunk and we learn.
Happy New Year! <laughs> after the Ball will be a surprise to people who only know it as a song. Now, of course, After the Ball is not by Kern. It's by Charles K. Harris, and it's a famous turn-of-the-century song. Kern often, in many of his musicals, used period songs to set a mood or establish a time frame. And what is happening in After the Ball, and I'm so glad it's on videotape so you can actually see what is going on, is Magnolia is making her debut as a professional debut as a singer at the Trocadero nightclub. She has just been deserted by Ravenel. She's got no money. She must find a way of supporting herself and her baby daughter, Kim. Ladies and gentlemen, I regret to announce that Miss Julie Wandell is indisposed and cannot appear tonight. Wait, 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 please, please. We are fortunate, however, in obtaining the services of Miss Magnolia Ravenel, who will sing for you an old favorite. Magnolia Ravenel? Who the hell is she? I'll show you who the hell she is. When she first comes out, she's scared to death and her throat closes up and Flicka actually sings it very badly, which is what she's supposed to do. I mean, her voice cracks and she stops singing and people are making noise at the tables and wine glasses are clinking and it's New Year's Eve and people are drunk and blowing noisemakers. Eventually the crowd starts to calm down and she actually sings it and sort of finds her wings and then she's off. Smile, Nola! Heart of Hearts, it's what I love the best, is walking in a Broadway theater and hearing that brassy sound. Um, it makes me feel sort of the most American. It's one of the things that I think is, is our calling card, really. The problem with vernacular American musical theater is that a lot of that music is composed for a kind of voice which opera singers for the most part do not cultivate, which is the sort of the mid-range, in, in the case of a female, what we call the belt voice, which is designed to project words at an uncultured volume throughout the theater, Ethel Merman being the prototype of this kind of voice. Showboat is a different kettle of fish, though, because 
more than any of these shows, and also because it's early, it's 1927, it really is sort of the last in the line of the great European operettas. And anybody who has ever tried to sing You Are Love will tell you that if you don't have an extremely well-trained classical operatic voice, you're going to turn blue and fall over halfway through it, which I've seen many tenors do. Um, Jerry, try in the vicinity of about uh, 80, 90. If one approaches Jerome Curran or Gershwin or Cole Porter with the same Brian stylistic Lincoln orientation that one approaches Mozart or Verdi, you're going to get something that is neither fish nor fowl and not necessarily a pleasing product in the end. I will take my loss so I'll pay for I know that in time my luck will turn it's bound to turn till good luck comes my way I'll play along while there's a game on the highway I'll stray along with just the turn of a wheel or the flip of a card as my guide I'll let fate decide if I walk or ride while on a if one has any sort of problem with one's image, whatever that means, as an opera singer, that, you know, I only sing opera, and therefore I can't cross over the, the line into do this music, then I think there is a problem. But um, if we look at the, the vocal tradition in which this music was written, we find that it did require for lack of a better word, legitimate vocal training in order to be able to sing this, this sort of music. Only make believe I love you Only make believe that you love me Others find peace of mind in pretend to the kind of singing that is required with a really first-class Viennese operetta. I think that the idea that this is only a musical and therefore it doesn't require uh, one to use <laughs> all of one's vocal ammunition is really wrong. Well, good luck comes my way, I'll play along While there's a game on the highway, I'll stray along with just the turn of a wheel or the flip of a card as my guide i let fate decide if I walk or ride Who I sit alone with your sorrow and kill the day There may be sunshine tomorrow to fill the day While I've a heart and a brain and my ebony cane I can borrow until the day when there's actually not that much music that Ravenel has to sing, but if I can quote Spencer Tracy, I think it was in Pat and Mike, he referred to Catherine Hepburn as, there's not much meat on her, but what there is is churse. For my next trick. <laughs> oh. Well, my goodness. Why? What? But will Jerome be proud? I think Jerry and Oscar will. Are, are, <laughs> they're floating up around. They're going. Way to go, guys. Great. Showboat to this generation has become essentially a medley of popular tunes, looking like a pretty little Valentine. 
If you asked anybody what Showboat was about, they couldn't even tell you. You know, it's about the Old South, a lot of romantic tunes, very boring ho-hum. Well, that's not what it really is about. And John McGlynn, by restoring the original orchestrations that were found in the Secaucus, New Jersey warehouse, um, and using the original 1927 script, which Hammerstein was kind enough to give to me on August 3rd, 1960, um, restored those values. And so the EMI Angel recording is the first opportunity since, really, since 1932, that the world at large has had to hear Showboat as initially conceived. I decided it was important to record all the music for two reasons. Showboat is such an important piece, perhaps in terms of a seminal work, the most important piece in the history of the American musical theater. And that gives even the discards an importance because one wants to see what the thought process and what the creative process was that Kern and Hammerstein went through. It's like looking at an artist's sketch book. It's a privilege. And, um, and, and when one hears songs that were deleted, not because of any aesthetic uh, lack of quality, but simply because of length, like the remarkable choral piece, Miseries Coming Round, why, uh, it's, it's miraculous. It gives such dimension to the work. Miseries Coming Around has had a very interesting history. It is the thematic cornerstone of, of the show. I mean, you hear this motive. All the time throughout, it's used as underscoring, it's used in the overture, but you never hear the song that it comes from. And um, the, the song was cut after the first performance in Washington, partly for time and partly because it was a very dark, brooding, tragic piece. And from the reports of the surviving members of the cast that I spoke to back in 1982, notably a fellow named Phil Sheridan, who was still alive, the piece scared Ziegfeld to death. And he and Kern evidently had big arguments about it, even during rehearsal. Ziegfeld went, you know, this is a musical comedy, guys, you know. And, but Kern was determined to keep it in the show, at least until the first performance and it got one performance in Washington and was never heard of again. I think it's interesting that we have evidence on two fronts of how important it was to Kern. The first is he salvaged the music and used it in the overture because he wanted that dark tragic feeling preserved. More importantly, he insisted that it be printed in the first edition of the vocal score. Misery's coming around them misery's coming around I knows it's coming around Don't know to who Misery's coming around Them misery's coming around We knows it's coming around Don't know to who I think that the purpose of this recording has been very well fulfilled, and I, I admire John for having gone through, and he, he pushed very hard to get this thing done. The only thing is that you can go too far with that sort of thing. I mean, if you took a great novel that had been successful over the years, and suddenly someone discovered a box full of notes that the author had struggled with and then finally discarded, uh, it would be terribly interesting to students. It would be fascinating to students, but you wouldn't publish it as a... As a a new version of the novel. See, the people who put this show together were pretty talented people. It was Oscar Hammerstein, he was young, but he was showing his talent. Jerome Kern, who had a lot of experience in the theater by that time, he was somewhat older than my father. Ziegfeld was no dope. And uh, when they made a decision that this song didn't work, or this one did, or this one could work if you did such and such, uh, they were not... Uh, dealing from a lack of knowledge and experience. So the material that was set aside was set aside for very solid reasons. I knew that if this music wasn't recorded on this recording, it would never be recorded anywhere else, because where else are you going to find an excuse to record 
the dropped songs from a musical, if not as an appendix to the main body of a recording. So it was, I knew it was either here or never, and I wasn't prepared to see the never part happen. And I am very proud that misery has been reinserted where it belongs, and the critical reaction has been, this changes the entire tone of the piece, because suddenly the show has an emotional core that, for my money, it never had to that extent before. cook on the boat, I keep everything, I run the ship more or less, don't tell the captain, but I really do. I, run, I, I just keep everything in order and my love interest and my love relationship with my husband is constantly nagging him, getting him to do the things that I need to have him do around the boat. And I sing many songs, one of which you'd probably be most familiar with, I'm, I'm involved in the ensemble of Can't Help Loving That Man of Mine. But if I found out he was no account, I'd stop loving him. Oh, no, you wouldn't. Once a girl like you starts to love a man, she don't stop so easy. Couldn't you stop loving Steve if he treated you mean? Oh, no, honey. No matter what he did. Why do you love Steve? Oh, I don't know. He's such a bad actor on the stage, and he thinks he's so good. Maybe that's why I love him. You see, child, Love's a funny thing. There's no sense to it. Teresa Stratus is singing Julie, which I consider to be quite a coup. And I must say I was a bit nervous before I started to work with her. But she has been a revelation to work with because she makes you work harder than you thought you could or needed to. wanted to do it for so long and it was the most important dream of my life 
And one of the things that sometimes makes those dreams so sweet is the knowledge that it's impossible and it could never happen. And it's funny, when I was a kid, there was a song that I loved, also by Oscar Hammerstein, as it turns out, from a musical version of Cinderella, they wrote. And it was called Impossible. And it was the song that the fairy godmother sang to Cinderella. She says, impossible for a plain yellow pumpkin to become a golden carriage. And she sings about all of these things that are impossible. And she says, but the world is full of zanies and fools who don't believe in sensible rules and won't believe what sensible people say. And because these daft and dewy-eyed dopes keep building up impossible hopes, impossible things are happening every day. And that song always inspired me when I was eight years old and I was feeling depressed about anything, getting my homework done or something. And it's sort of, I'm, I'm living proof that impossible things are happening every day. <laughs> Fine musicals, and then there's Showboat. There are many shows that are better constructed. There are many shows that have a much more logical ending. Uh, but Showboat encompasses so much. There's such a, a wealth of humanity. These aren't just characters in a show. These are real people. I mean, you, you see Showboat once, or you hear that record album once, and you come away knowing those people. You know Parthi, and you know Captain Andy, and you know Julie, and you know Magnolia. I can't explain why you know them. It's not that they're written so much better, let's say, than Anna and the King of Siam and the King and I. It's not as though they're better written than Sky Masterson, uh, you know, or, or any of the characters in, in the best of the Broadway musicals. But for some reason, they become family members in your old family album.
This program has been made possible by the financial support of viewers